everyone. Welcome to NESG Radio. My name is Shay Vincent. I am your host for today. I am very pleased to have with me Dr. Ayodele Cole Benson. Dr. Benson is the thematic lead for the Health as a Business thematic group of the Health Policy Commission. With over 29 years of experience in medicine and business, Dr. Benson is the current chairman of EcoScan Services Limited. Welcome to NESG Radio, Dr. Benson. It's so great to have you with us. Thank you so much, Shay. I'm glad to be here. Great. Okay, so World Health Day comes up 7th of April. World Health Days provide an opportunity to focus the world's attention on a health problem or issue that deserves special attention. This year, the theme for World Health Day is My Health, My Right. Now, the WHO Council on the Economics of Health for All has found that at least 140 countries recognize health as a human right in their constitution, yet countries are not passing and putting into practice laws to ensure their populations are entitled to access health services. Without health, a person is denied their right to be contributing members of society and to provide for their families. Right to health is the right of everyone to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. So today we are focusing on my health, my right. Okay, so Dr. Benson, is health considered a fundamental human right in Nigeria and perhaps other African countries? If yes, to what extent would you say we have this in reality? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, Great question. Yes, regionally, uh, health is considered as a right in Africa, in most of the African countries. Uh, Actually, the African Charter for Human, I mean, on Human Rights and People's Rights, the African Charter on Human Rights and People's Rights, you know, has, uh, you know, the right to health as one of the guaranteed tenets um, in that charter. Nationally, also, we are guaranteed under Chapter 2 of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, 1999, as amended, and also in the National Health Insurance Act scheme, uh, 1999, as amend, I mean, 1999, you know, um, that health should be a right to the citizens of Nigeria. Okay, so to that extent, yes. Uh, we have those in the Constitution, we have it in the National Health Insurance uh, Scheme Act. But then, as a lived reality, no, uh, that's not our lived reality. We, we do not have equitable access to health care today. Um, depending on the demographics and then where you live around the country, certain places, uh, do not have access to healthcare. So when you don't have access to healthcare uh, services, uh, we can't say that health, therefore, is a fundamental right in that situation. Thank you. Thank you very much for that answer. So, um, based on the laws of the land, yes. However, when it comes to the reality of the situation, we have not been able to achieve equitable access to health care. Okay, so this brings uh, me to the next question. So what can we do as a nation to ensure that we achieve equitable access to health care services and this becomes a reality in Nigeria? Yeah, thank you. Equitable access in the first instance will mean availability of health care services anywhere people live around the country urban or suburban or rural communities alike. So obviously this is a tough ask, uh, but considering that government uh, has established about 33,000 primary healthcare centers around the country, located across, you know, every local government in different wards, you know, literally everywhere. It seems achievable to provide equitable access to healthcare to the Nigerian population, you know, uh, irrespective of the place of domicile. But unfortunately, just about one third of, or less 
of these primary healthcare uh, centers are functional. So, in the good mind of um, our leaders in government, they have built primary healthcare centers across the country to ensure equitable access to at least that basic level of care. But with only one third functional, I think the real question now will be how do we make those uh, BHCs functional such that we can have the three tiers of our healthcare system well synchronized, functional from primary care to secondary care and then to tertiary care, as the case may be. So my uh, proposition in this case will be uh, that first we need to begin to look at uh, increasing public-private dialogue and engagement. Today, the private uh, healthcare industry in Nigeria renders about 60% of the healthcare services to the population. Okay, so if we can deliberately bring the private sector participation in the implementation, you know, to operationalize all our PHCs in the country, I think we will arrive at offering Nigerians the most basic primary care services in every locality across the nation. We will arrive there faster than we are doing presently. Okay, and that's why I was talking about uh, improving private-public dialogue and engagement. Okay, and if we do that, that will be a step in the right direction in providing equitable access to healthcare you know, to Nigerians. And now this is, I'm talking about this from the supply side. You know, in this issue around access to care, we always need to look at it from the supply side and also from the demand side. Everything starts from the supply side. If the healthcare service is not available, it is not available. So people can't even have access to what is not available. So we start from the basic supply of healthcare services and that's why I'm talking about engaging the private sector more. They have the critical mass. They are offering so much already to Nigerians. Up to 60% or more of the care we receive as Nigerians come from the private sector. So if government is able to engage more with the private sector, I think we will be able to bridge the supply gaps in terms of spread of healthcare services across the country in every local government area across all the six geopolitical zones. Having done that, you then want to look at the uh, demand side, which means if somebody is actually ill, how easily uh, can that person go to a, a, a public hospital or a private hospital to obtain care without necessarily having all the money in his or her pocket? because that also limits access. The fact that today, uh, more than 80% of our healthcare needs are paid for out of pocket. So that again is a problem when you talk about equitable access to healthcare. So um, on the demand side, there has to be mechanisms that allows population to access care at a time of need, even if it has it is at that basic primary healthcare level. To that extent, government has also come up with the basic healthcare provision scheme, and you know, so that uh, when that goes into force, perhaps well implemented, it will be able to provide access to primary healthcare to Nigerians, irrespective of your place of domicile. But that is having solved the supply side uh, of the equation. Then that demand side can be breached by the basic healthcare provision fund. Thank you. Great, fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, So one of the key things that you highlighted is the issue with functionality of primary healthcare centers. And um, that's something that we need to address. And, uh, you know, involving the private sector is a very important way for us to address that issue. So thank you very much. Okay, so we've talked about um, equitable access to healthcare. We also know that um, quality healthcare is also a big problem. Access to quality healthcare. So people might be able to access um, primary healthcare centers, but the quality of care 
um, might leave a lot to be desired. So what are the constraints to um, quality healthcare in Nigeria and how can these be overcome? Yes, yeah, so the, the issue around quality um, is not a problem that can be solved just you know, uh, in a day. It will take some deliberate steps. Now, when you talk about quality, you, you will also want to talk about pricing, okay? Because uh, quality, to a large extent, will also impact on pricing of the service that is to be obtained. Now, against the backdrop that uh, as a nation, where we are right now in the general scheme of things, we are facing significant inflationary trends. Last month, for instance, we were having figures around 31% inflation rate. Now, having a reasonably priced, high quality care becomes a tough ask. That is where the care is available. Because when you talk about quality, you're going to look at first the cost of delivering that care, cost on the supply of the service that you want to, you know, that the patient has come to assess. <clears throat> you look at cost from the medical devices perspective, cost from the equipment, cost on reagents, and cost, you know, uh, on drugs. As of today, most of our medical devices medical equipment, reagents, and consumables, more than 90% of those are imported and those impacts on Forex. Therefore, pricing becomes an issue. Just about 50% or there about 53% of our common drugs used for everyday uh, treatment are manufactured locally, just about 50 to 53%. The major branded products and new drugs coming into uh, different clinical disciplines are all imported. These are things that will affect the quality of care because if you don't have <clears throat> good quality drugs and uh, good equipment to attend to patients, good medical devices to attend to patients, then you can't talk about quality. But you can't talk about these things again without talking about the cost of acquisition, the cost of implementation. So long as we are importing most of what we need in our healthcare system, then the quality of care issues becomes very serious because we are not able to provide what we need to care for our patients most of the time, whether in the private or in the public sphere of our healthcare system. Today, whether you're running a private hospital or you're running a public hospital, you supply a lot of your energy need by running generators. The generators run on diesel and today the diesel is going for about 1,650 naira per liter. At the end of the day, a patient that is lying uh, in the hospital, on the hospital ward, uh, needs, you know, you know, some level of comfort. Whether you're running the air conditioner or you're turning on the fan, or whatever, you're using any equipment on that patient that will impact on quality, you need to run on power. And that's affecting the price of service delivery. And therefore, in an attempt to cut costs, sometimes the hospital is not able to provide power to, the, you know, to run its own services. You also talk about the human resource aspect of quality human resource aspect of care delivery that will impact on quality. Again, we have a situation where Nigerian healthcare workers are living in droves to other African countries, to Europe, to America, and every other part of the world for, you know, better economic um, circumstances. In that situation, it's leaving major gaps in our ability to offer high quality care to our population. We are now having to do task shifting such that roles that ordinarily doctors used to play, like I talked about running primary healthcare centers, 
now we have to be running those primary health care centers with nurses, with uh, community health um, extension workers. We have to be running those centers with, you know, people lower down the rankings in the healthcare ecosystem. So those will impact on quality. All right. And every other thing I talked about also will impact on pricing. When you talk about uh, rendering primary, I mean, private healthcare services in Nigeria, uh, even the hospitals and health facilities that are doing very well, at the end of the day, spend close to 30% or more of their income on wage bills. And where you try to cut those wage bills, the wage bill costs, it also means lowering on the quality of the personnel you are using to deliver the service. And that will impact on cost. So I think that, you know, that will not only impact on cost, it will, it will impact on quality, I meant to say. So I think that what we need to do will be to find, you know, ways of bringing, uh, again, the government in, in this conversation to see how we can better our circumstances as a nation. We have to be deliberate in policies that lower the eventual cost of running healthcare services. Whether you are importing medical devices, whether you are importing drugs, there has to be metrics or policies that will lower the cost of that importation. We need to improve on the volume of our local manufacturing of uh, drugs and medical consumables. We need to. Because if we don't, we cannot always afford the high cost of importation. So we need to have local assets. We also have to be deliberate in getting power to our healthcare facilities because medical equipment run on power. And where you ha always have these interrupted power supplies, we cannot render high quality services to our people. We need to lower costs you know, of service delivery in order to be able to achieve a certain level of outcomes in terms of quality. Now, on the demand side, like I said before, we need to strengthen our health insurance systems such that on the demand side, uh, people should be able to assess healthcare services at the time of need without having money in their pocket. Because eventually, if we have a, a health insurance system that works for the population, unlike what we have today, then even the suppliers of the healthcare services will be able to go all out in making those provisions available because they know that people have ability to pay when they obtain service through maybe a third party payer system, like I said, strengthening the health insurance. So these changes need to happen before our overall quality can improve. It is not enough, for instance, to set up a quality commission without dealing with the issues around the supply, the cost of supply of services, and the cost of demand for those services. We also need to improve on regulation if we're talking about quality. There has to be minimum benchmarks enforced, you know, in the industry to be able to limit people uh, in the kind of things that they are able to do in that industry. Today, you go to motor parks, you see people peddling drugs, carrying it on their heads, selling to, you know, consumers that are ill-informed, some of those drugs are expired. Some of those drugs are fake. And these people go freely, walk freely in the society, hawk these drugs around without anybody questioning what they are doing. You find a situation where any medical personnel who puts on a white clothing uh, in the name of clinical coat is called a doctor. That impacts on quality. So until we also have regulations that keep people in check in what they are able to do and what they are able not to do in the healthcare industry, we will struggle with quality. So if our population must enjoy 
health as a right, then we must implement regulations by, you know, by government that will help to sanitize the industry, the healthcare industry, whether in the public sector or in the private sector. Issues around licensing, issues around minimum uh, operating standards, issues around, you know, continuous medical education. These are things that impact on quality and somebody has to enforce them. Somebody has to enforce those, those regulations. Thank you. I think I should stop there so I don't go on and on. Great, fantastic. Um, that was a very exhaustive answer, Dr. Benson. So you <laughs> talked about um, the importance of lowering costs for service delivery, improving the volume of local um, manufacturing. So that's critically important. And, um, you know, the importance of, of also access to power for healthcare facilities. They also touched on um, the demand side, um, in particular, strengthening health insurance systems. And then you touched on also the importance of improving regulation um, so that um, actors that are not qualified to provide care and um, to um, administer treatment are sanctioned. Okay, so thank you very much. Okay, so in terms of the goal of equitable access to quality healthcare, would you say this is achievable? And if so, how long do you think it will take us? Particularly since as a country, we promoted health for all by the year 2000, and we're now in 2024, and we are yet to achieve this reality. Yes, thank you. I mean, uh... I remember back in the days when we, it was touted health for all by the year 2000. And before we knew what was happening, 2000 came, and here we are in 2024, like you said, and health for all is still a far cry from being a reality. Now, it is not about the timeline that it will take. It is more about the principal actors in government, that are in charge of our healthcare systems. It is about what they do, you know, to make health for all a reality. We have to be intentional. You know, we, we need to become intentional as players in that industry, public and private sector alike, to actually come together to hash out a plan that will be very holistic, you know, in a comparison uh, most of what I outlined before and much more, then backed with the political will to implement the plan. Because again, as a country, we are not short of white papers, policies and plans, but we hardly then implement those plans to the letter. So you may come up with a 10 years plan. You may then call it the National Health Plan 2024 to 2034 call it a national health plan, have some milestones, some deliverables year on year, what you intend to achieve, how much of your healthcare insurance penetration you want to achieve one year to another, how much of, um, you know, regulations and quality you want to attain one year to another, how much of local manufacturing of, uh, you know, drugs and consum medical consumables you want to achieve one year to another. Uh, a country like South Korea today have up to 99% of their medical consumables, their medical devices and equipment, everything they use in their healthcare system, locally manufactured in South Korea. So the importation into the healthcare system, very, very minimal. It's achievable, but there has to be a plan to it. There has to be policy that back that plan. There has to be deliberate intention by all concerned to make the plan work. Now, today, we find situations where government will enact policies, but the same government in a different arm of government is not honoring the policy. So you have situations where the leader of the country will say, oh, we are removing import duties on medical equipment. We have slashed it from XYZ percent to 10% or 1% or whatever. 
Then you get to the port and the customs say, sorry, we don't have the gazette to back that up. You must pay the due bill, the due charges. So you have things like an ambulance having the same HS code like you are importing a luxury car. Whereas there is a government policy somewhere that says ambulance should be cleared, you know, as a healthcare, you know, equipment that should attract a lower cost of uh, clearing. So that's why I said we have to be intentional. And all the actors that are involved in that whole milieu, you know, have to be in agreement that yes, Nigerian deserves health as a right. And if we do deserve health, access to health care for all, then we have to be intentional in the policies and processes we put in place to make it happen. We need to put a timeline to it, like you mentioned, it could be a 10 years time timeline, could be a seven years timeline. If we're very ambitious, it could be a five years timeline. But setting the timelines by Ministry of Health, for instance, whereas Minister of Finance is not involved in that plan, it will not work. All the actors have to be involved. Setting that goal at the national level, whereas the targets are not cascaded down to the sub-national levels across the states and the local government areas, it's not going to work. So there has to be a holistic approach if we are actually serious in making health for all an achievable goal for all Nigerians. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Dr. Benton. It's very important to have a holistic plan which is backed by political will. Okay, so as you know, almost all the SDGs are linked in some way to health. So achieving the SDGs will depend heavily on ensuring the right to health for all. In terms of the role that NESG can play, what do you think the NESG can do to help in the overall universal health coverage agenda for Nigeria um, in meeting the SDG goals in health? Well, any ASG being an apolitical think tank organization can actually do so much. Uh, and this is, a, this, an, this is a body that has been there now clocking 30 years. Therefore, uh, at least any ASG has been in the recent history of the nation and most of the trajectory the nation has gone through, any ASG has been involved in most of those trajectories. Therefore, NESD, you know, can play a pivotal role as an intervener, as a dialogue partner, as a watchdog, you know, to bring all the relevant stakeholders to the table to chart a new course. As an advocacy think tank in the policy arena, NESG can provide evidence-based policies of what has worked in other countries and share those lessons with our healthcare policymakers and healthcare policy drivers so that we can also make relevant changes in our own circumstances that we reposition Nigeria and reposition our healthcare system, you know, uh, as a nation. So I think that NESG, uh, based on the extensive work uh, we do out there uh, across the different uh, uh, policy commissions and thematic groups, I think NESG can do a lot. NESG can begin to lead those conversations. NESG can be that uh, critical intervener, you know, in this regard. Uh, NESG can keep the issues about this change dialogue, you know, to put it on the, to keep it on the front burner consistently so that government and the people the relevant stakeholders, the people involved, can pay attention. So I think NESG has a lot to do, uh, and we also need to, you know, deploy the right, uh, you know, the, the right tools in that whole engagement process uh, to be able to get the attention of the critical stakeholders 
that needs to be having this conversation. We need to, as NASD, be able to provide to our leaders um, what the outcomes would be if healthcare becomes accessible to all Nigerians. In terms of the increase in the national productivities that we should expect, in terms of the overall impact that good health for the people will mean, in terms of the critical outcomes in our healthcare indices that would improve, NASD can easily uh, be putting those you know, information out there as we engage with the relevant stakeholders so that they know how important and why this is important. Today, Nigeria loses so much in outbound medical tourism. When you check the statistics, people are citing $1 billion per annum, people are citing all manner of figures that leave the country in multiples of millions of dollars annually for people true true you know people seeking health care overseas outbound medical tourism those are monies that can be retained in country if we reshape our healthcare system and reposition it in such a way that we can you know attend to our people at the time of need with good quality care you know, at any time, such that is achieved already, uh, just like it has been achieved already in some other geographies. If other countries have achieved it just by being meticulous and being steadfast in their quest uh, to that um, uh, accomplishment, I think we too can achieve it, but we need to be deliberate. So NASG can you know, bring all this to the table, NASG can lead in those conversations, NASG can continue to advocate. And I believe as we do that, we should be able to um, get the right attentions, especially because NASG, like I said, is apolitical, non-partisan. So this is not about the interest of any sector or the interest of any one human being. No, it is about national interest. So long as NASG continues to represent, you know, the good people of Nigeria in its advocacies, I think NASG has the credibility to convey, you know, uh, these dialogues and also to play the roles of um, a watchdog in that process. Thank you. Great, fantastic. Thank you very much, Dr. Benson. So NASG um, has a critical role to play in terms of um, pushing the um, universal health, health coverage agenda. Thank you very much. Okay, so do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to share before we conclude this interview? Thank you, Sherry. Uh, health as a right is possible. That will be my submission. It is also achievable, but we must be ready as advocates, national leaders, healthcare champions, and also as citizens to make it a reality. Now, why do I bring the import of the citizens here also? Because assuming today government comes out with mandatory health insurance as a way to go in bridging our, I mean, in bridging the gaps in the penetration of health insurance in our nation, the same citizens of this country will fight it. The same citizens of this country will tell you that they have more compelling needs than spend money to pay for health insurance. Okay, so we also as citizens, we have a role to play if we must attain, you know, health for all at any one point in our history. If we must make access to universal health care possible, then we have a role to play as citizens, such that when government actually come with one policy or another in the direction that will lead us to that uh, overall goal, we as citizens have to cooperate with government to make it achievable, to make any plan 
that has been put in place to be workable. If we continue to have resistance uh, from our own population, then it becomes difficult to implement. And I say this because of the experiences that some states that are trying to implement the health insurance scheme in their various states, the challenges that they have encountered, even from their own citizens. You know, it tells you that we do have a role to play as citizens, to cooperate with government, to work with government, to make health for all a reality. So that would be my final thought, so that we are not pushing the bug only um, to the side of government, no, as citizens, as healthcare leaders, as healthcare advocates, as healthcare champions. We all have roles to play in that whole agenda. But we need to start talking to each other. We need to start to have those conversations so that people will see what is in it for them. So that the population will see what it is actually uh, that this goal will mean in their lives. Such that government will be able to see the uh, economic indices that will dramatically change for the better if our citizens are healthy and they have access to healthcare at the time of need. Once we begin to have those uh, conversations and we are ready to, you know, uh, put a skin in the game, as they say, both as individuals, as leaders, and as healthcare champions, then we are able to, we are most likely going to be able to achieve our objectives. So those will be my final thoughts. And thank you for having me on the show today. I hope that um, Nigeria will experience health as a right to its citizens in our lifetime. Thank you. Great. Fantastic. Yes, we all wish that. And thanks for emphasizing the importance of all stakeholders, you know, playing their part, particularly the importance of, you know, citizens cooperating with, um, you know, critical policies that have been put in place by the government. So thank you so much, Dr. Benson. It's been fantastic having you with us. To listen to more episodes, please be sure to visit our website, www.nesgroup.org forward slash podcast. I've been your host, Shay Vincent. Until next time, bye for now.